In this week's news, some SpaceX leaked imagery reveals damage to Booster 7, Rocket Lab's first launch from the USA has a new customer, and Axion 1 has returned to Earth. For the last time in April, this is Tomorrow's Space News. The biggest story out of Starbase this week is this leaked image from inside of Booster 7. You're looking at the downcomer transfer tube, which runs straight down the middle of the liquid oxygen tank, the bottom tank in Super Heavy, to allow methane from the top tank to reach the Raptor engines. It's unknown how this happened, but looking at the way the tube has been warped, it seems as if the pressure inside the tube at some point was lower than the pressure outside of the tube, giving it the shape of a paper straw you've used after three sips. We weren't sure if SpaceX would go through all the effort to repair Booster 7 or if they'd just scrap it and move on to Booster 8. However, we have seen signs that fixing B7 may be the route forward. Firstly, a new transfer tube has arrived at Starbase in two parts as it needs to be able to fit onto the back of a truck. There is no confirmation that this is for Booster 7 though, it's just been delivered. The following day, a crew on a cherry picker was seen working into the liquid oxygen tank, which adds to the theory that SpaceX are trying to save Booster 7. Nothing official as of yet has come out from anybody, so this is all speculation using leaked imagery and the latest we can see happening at Starbase. With Booster 7 rolling into the high bay, Booster 8 had to be rolled out into the production site, allowing everyone to see the section constructed so far. This new super heavy thrust puck has also been delivered, which is what the Raptor engines at the bottom of the booster are attached to. We've been seeing a lot of Raptor 2 engines being delivered over the past week, such as Raptor 2 number 42, number 51, and two other engines which have had Lego minifigure faces added onto the top. Three Raptor vacuum thrust simulators have been making their way to the launch site on the back of this truck. As it says in the name, these will simulate the thrust produced by the Raptor vacuum engines underneath a Starship. These were installed onto suborbital pad A. This new very smooth nose cone has been spotted within one of the production tents and compared to the nose cones we have seen on previous Starship vehicles, this is the sleekest thing I have ever seen. The chopsticks have been testing again, here they were seen moving to the top of the tower and then back down in the middle of the night. Star Factory is the name which has been given to the permanent structure which is replacing the tents at the Starbase production site and a few more pillars have sprung up in the past week. Star Factory won't be replacing this however, which is what we've been calling the wide bay since it began construction, but in a recent document from the FCC the building is now officially called High Bay 2. We heard from SpaceX before that they were interested in selling Starlink to airlines for use on their aircraft for in-flight Wi-Fi and the first deal has been signed with JSX, an airline that doesn't call themselves an airline, getting in-flight Wi-Fi later this year. JSX doesn't call themselves an airline because they do operate some private charter flights, however they also do scheduled flights, so to me, just an airline. Up to 100 of their fleet of Embraer ERJ 135LRs, ERs and 145LR aircraft will be receiving the Starlink transformation and all passengers will get to use the service for free with their already purchased ticket. This opens another market for SpaceX which now means they can target three specific customers to help put Starlink on the world stage which are single users with the normal service, businesses with Starlink business and now airlines. This is Nuri, officially known as the KSLV-2 or the Korean Space Launch Vehicle 2. Its first flight was last October, however due to an unexpected early shutdown of the third stage the payload did not reach the required velocity for orbit and it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Despite this however, South Korea isn't shrinking their space budget, they're expanding it. 619 million US dollars is the amount of money which Kari, the Korean space agency, will be receiving, which is 15% up on the original proposal from the government. It's also a 19% increase over the amount of money that they received in 2021. The KSLV-2 will have just under 29% of the total budget dedicated to development of the rocket, just shy of 180 million USD. Some money is also going to head in the direction of development of a high-performance liquid fueled engine which will power the successor to Nuri. The single largest share of the budget however goes to satellite projects at 276.4 million with 70 million more going towards a Korean version of GPS dedicated to navigation within South Korea. Called the Korean Positioning System, a constellation of eight satellites will be deployed between 2027 and 2034. Rocket Lab officially declared that their first and currently only launch pad in the United States was completed in December of 2019, with the first launch commencing just 10 months later in the autumn of 2020 with a payload from the US Space Force. 
pretty much everything about that is now changed apart from the launch pad which is launch pad 2 at the mid-atlantic regional spaceport on wallops island in virginia Officially, the launch pad is called Launch Complex 2, as Rocket Lab operates Launch Complex 1 on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. However, the two other pads at Wallops are called Launch Pad 0A and Launch Pad 0B. Technicalities aside, let's get into what has changed about the inaugural flight from this pad. No longer is the customer the Space Force, as their payload was already launched in July last year from Mahia. The new payload is six satellites for Hawkeye 360, which will be the first launch of three contracted flights with the company. If you've never heard of them, Hawkeye 360 is a geospatial analytics company and they were the first commercial seller of radio frequency location data which was gathered via a satellite constellation. They have plans for a 30 satellite constellation which this mission would go towards. Currently they have launched four satellite clusters into orbit. Rocket Lab has performed a wet dress rehearsal on Launch Pad 2, which they completed in April 2020, which is what this photo is from. All that is left to do is launch, which, fingers crossed, should be later this year in December. Last night, into the early hours of Tuesday the 26th local time, NASA rolled back SLS from LC-39B to the VAB for repairs for the next attempt at the wet dress rehearsal. I went into a deeper dive into this last week, so go and check out that episode of the news if you want to learn more. Just before we get into a busy space traffic update with Axion 1 returning, it has been just over a month since I posted the Psyche campaign video, so I thought I'd provide a bit of an update. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm raising the funds to head out to Florida in August to cover the launch of the Psyche spacecraft to the asteroid Psyche on a Falcon Heavy. Over 60 people have contributed just over £3,500 so far in just over a month, which is a lot more than I expected, so to everyone who's given money so far, thank you so much. May and June will most likely be the period where the best deals are on offer for flights and I'm currently eyeing up a couple options with British Airways and Virgin Atlantic so it'll just depend on which one of them is the cheapest at the time when it comes to booking. Once things have actually been bought I'll make sure to update my website linked below where all of the finances are going to be published so you can make sure that the money you've very kindly given to me will be spent on the correct items. Also this image may seem random but it isn't. Last week I told you that this is Falcon Heavy Core B1074 at McGregor in testing. I've now found out that this is the core stage, the exact core stage, which will be used to launch Psyche. So B1074, fingers crossed, I'll be seeing you in the flesh very soon. Everyone who publicly contributes to the fund will have their name added to a special slate, which will be at the end of all the content that these people make possible, which It'll probably span far beyond the actual trip itself because I'm planning to get a lot of footage to use in a lot of videos. So if you decide to help out, you'll certainly be thanked. The link to contribute should have been on your screen at some point. It'll be in the description and it will be at the end of the video. Right now, however, let's get into space traffic. Just one launch to cover this week, which was Starlink Group 4 Mission 14. Commencing at 1751 UTC on April 21st, 53 satellites with a total mass of over 16 metric tons lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 near the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida on top of Falcon 9 booster B1060, which joined B1051 to match the record of launching and landing 12 times. The landing in question was on Just Read the Instructions and the fairing halves were recovered by the support ship Bob. Axion 1 was stuck on the International Space Station for a few days due to unfavourable weather back on the ground or above the water surrounding Florida. However, at 0110 Coordinated Universal Time on the 25th of April, Dragon Endeavour departed the Zenith ports on the Harmony module and headed back to Earth. Following a nominal re-entry, Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Mark Pathy and Aiton Stibby splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean just after 1700 UTC near Jacksonville in Florida. The capsule was hooked up onto the recovery ship and lifted into the Dragon Nest and then the four-man crew left Endeavour for the final time. The upcoming Earth departures are a Hyperbola 1 launch, Crew 4 and Angara 1.2, Electron's first recovery attempt along March 11 with a bunch of payloads along March 2C, Starlink 416 and potentially another Electron launch with Capstone. And here is your space weather with Dr. Tamitha Scove. After all the activity we've been having over the past 10 days or so, our sun is 
finally beginning to calm down just a little bit. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we still have quite a few active regions on the Earth-facing disk, including a few really big flare players. Region 2993, 94, and 95 are still uh, have high chances for big solar flares, just not the X factor that we've been dealing with over the past week. It looks like these regions are finally going to quiet down to some degree, and those radio blackouts aren't coming quite so fast and furiously. But we do still have some solar storms being launched. We had one launched on the 24th on the west side of the disk, and we also have an, what looks to be a new solar storm player that's going to be rotating more into Earth view here over the next couple days. This is region 2999, so we're watching it closely. Now on top of that, we also have a big coronal hole you can see here. That's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone in about four to five days, and it could be sending us some fast solar wind. So aurora photographers definitely get another chance at some aurora show. Now as we take a look at our far side of the sun, this is stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. You can see that big coronal hole. That's the one that's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone in about four or five days. But look behind it to the east limb. Look at all those active regions. There could be very well several different sunspot clusters in here. And although these don't necessarily look like they're going to be big flare players, they are launching solar storms. So we could get even more chances for uh, solar storms hitting Earth in about a uh, a week or so, because there could be some decent Earth-directed launches. For more details on this week's space weather, including how these big flare players might affect space traffic, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Station 204 is not a free space station. It does cost a bit of money to keep operational, and the people who contribute to the show to help us out are the citizens of tomorrow. Being a member comes with several perks, which I think are very cool, such as access to space news scripts as they're being written, and exclusive to the pre- and post-show hangouts surrounding the Tomorrow Live show. If you want to join the Escape Velocity Orbital Suborbital and Ground Support Citizens, head over to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join, or just hit the bright blue join button below. Next to the join button is the subscribe button, which shouldn't be red because if it is, that means the show is no go. So to make sure that we stay on the air, make sure to disable that button and turn it grey. As I mentioned earlier, my Psyche launch coverage campaign is linked down below. So if you're considering contributing to that, trust me, it'll be worth it. For now though, thank you for watching and goodbye.